10 seconds uh dr bawa you may bawa singh sir you may please oh. start the session oh. right after it goes online now Uh, 10 seconds. Uh, Dr. Bawa, you may, Bawa Singh, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. It's live, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. This is the view of uh, Albert Einstein. And I think in the present context, uh, religion has been playing very important role, not only in social science, rather in science as well. So uh, with these words, Sabiko Namaskar, Sasrikal, good afternoon to one and all. Central University of Punjab has been celebrating Foundation Week from 21st to 28th February 2022 on the eve of its 13th. Foundation Day taking place on 28th February 2022. On this auspicious occasion, the Foundation Week, the fourth special lecture in series, is going to be delivered today. Today's speaker is retired Professor Paramji Singh Jijaj, Department of Sociology, Gurunanak Dev University, Amritsar. He is going to speak on the topic issues in the nature of science and social sciences. Before beginning, as per the university convention, the program is to be started with the university kulgi. So I request Professor Felix, please play university kulgi. So therefore I request one and all, please stand up. So, uh, welcome back. I feel it is indeed proud, privilege, and honor to welcome of today's speaker and participants. First of all, I would like to extend very warm welcome to the patron of today's program, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Raghavendra Prashad Tiwariji, who is the torch bearer of this uh, program. Also, I'd like to extend warm welcome from my core of heart to Professor Paramji Singh Dijas who spared some moments from his busy schedule to share his valuable ideas with us. And also extend warm welcome to the uh, Dean Charge Academics, Dean Search, Dean Student Welfare, Dean Schools, all HODs, <clears throat> faculty member, research scholars, and student, and last but not the least, valuable parts, participants connected with us through the uh, media of live stream YouTube. Now, uh, let me come to the uh, beginning of the program. Uh, today's topic is issues in the nature of science and uh, social sciences. The human being has traveled a long journey with a lot of ups and downs, whose mind has always been driven by curiosity and rationality. Even the modern life of uh, human being trapped in the very uh, complex nature of issues with the advancement of science and social sciences, these issues have become more complex and critical. However, most of the people think that science is just uh, revolving around technology, engineering, pharmaceuticals, computers, space exploration, etc., etc. 
but that is not the true case. This was, in fact, the promise of uh, pioneers of modern science during the 17th century. So it is frequently less acknowledged that the interface of social and natural sciences have also developed technology and engineering that had influenced our everyday lives, such as poll campaigns, marketing, management, insurance, public policy, health programs, et cetera, et cetera. So when we look at history through the lens of science and social sciences, the interface and intersectionality has remained engrossed in both good and bad times. Given the scientific advancements, exceptional progresses in commerce, transportation, communication, health, and education have been achieved by the social complexity, political chaos and instability, social unrest and movements, intellectual crisis, and unhealthy competition among people have always become bad towards in the uh, present and modern world. Against this background, the intersectionality between science and social science are being explored through the debates, the discussions, and serves work in order to find out the solutions of the critical societal issues that are being haunted by the modern society in day-to-day -day life. Here, it is a point wherein it is anticipated that the interface and intersectionality between science and social science might take place. Against these complex nature of issues, both science and social sciences have been making best effort to make this uh, present world as the best place to live in. Now, I will introduce the today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Pramji Singh Jad, former uh, professor, Department of Sociology, Gurunanak Dev University. He got his education from Punjab University, Ch Chandigarh, and uh, he had also held you know, uh, various uh, positions in academics in Gurunanak Dev University. Uh, he held uh, the position Dean Academic Affairs, Gurunanak Dev University, Director Internet. Inter, uh, internal Quality Assurance Cell, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, National Fellow of ICSR New Delhi, Dean Faculty of Arts, <laughs> Coordinator Center for the Society, uh, Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy. Uh, Professor Jaj has also very wide experience in uh, search. He had published uh, his career around about 21 books and uh, research on doing social science, uh, doing social research uh, published by uh, publications. Uh, Professor Jaj has also uh, you know, published uh, a number of articles in uh, non national and international uh, journals. <laughs> Sir has also you know, uh, paid, uh, uh, visited a number of uh, foreign countries in context of academic uh, uh, publishers like the USA, UK, uh, Canada, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sir had also very long list of uh, awards and honors. Sir had also made you no know, president Indian Sociological Society, elected as president Northwest Indian Sociological Association. Treasurer, Indian Sociological Society, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, National Fellows of the Indian Council of Social Science Research in Delhi, Member of Managing Committee, Indian Sociological Society, Member of Managing Committee of the Northwest Indian Sociological Society, and he had also honored with Mata Lakshmi Devi a regional award by uh, Kala Sirjak in uh, 2007. And he had also made a uh, secretary NWISA uh, chandigarh. So now, I with these words, I request uh, Professor P. S. Paramji Singh Jaj to share his valuable ideas with the uh, participants. Sir, please. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I begin by congratulating uh, the university on the occasion of uh, the 30th Foundation Day, which uh, it is celebrating under the leadership of Professor R. Pithwadi, an old colleague of mine and dear friend. And I wish the university all the best that under his leadership, the university would further progress 
and develop and expand, which is expected uh, because I know him uh, and know his dynamism uh, as a young, when he was a young teacher like me uh, in Nehu and Mizoram. Uh, after having said that, uh, let me start with the whole question of science and social sciences. I'm not going to talk about the benefits of science and social sciences. I'm going to talk about uh, the very issues involved in the nature of these two and some kind of you know uh, tension which has been emerging over a period of time because of many reasons, because of uh, science particularly having some of its aspects which are very important. So it is because of this that uh, uh, let me begin, uh, first of all, uh, with uh, a document prepared uh, under the chairmanship of uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein. Uh, this was the report of the commission. Uh, commission was established by uh, the government of Portugal in 1990s, uh, and a um, large number of uh, social scientists got involved, also some scientists. And it was called the Bankian Commission. And this Gulbankian Commission submitted its report, and subsequently, in a bridged form, this report was published uh, uh, around that time. Now, it is in this particular uh, uh, context that I start my lecture that what this particular report says. There are two, three things it says, which is very important. Number one, uh, till the Dominant or domination of science, which, which comes out at a particular historical point. Most of the universities in Europe, whether Oxford or Cambridge, they were essentially seminaries. They were training priests, uh, Christian priests, and this was their function. But they suddenly, at one historical point, the states realized that it is important that uh, we start teaching other subjects, other things than religion. And then uh, science was the first to do it. Right from the beginning, it was the because of the benefits of science, about which I'll talk about later, a uh, little later, and uh, that the state started realizing that there is a need for further and further development in science. We know historically that science is not not technology, and technology is also not science. Right from the ancient Greeks, the distinction was made between doxa, epistome, and techne. Techne was what we call a technology, and it used to develop independent of epistome, which was essentially a knowledge where doxa was an opinion. So it is in this context that uh, it was science whose benefits were seen at a particular point, how it was seen, this is something I'll talk about uh, a little later. This is one thing which is very important for us. Also in the process, social sciences were, were also introduced because when this whole thing happened, at that time, not much distinction was existing because then uh, we didn't have sociology, but we have what we call it uh, uh, philosophy, particularly mathematics. They were sometimes inseparable, and also what we call it politics, study of politics or civics. So it was also seen that these could be beneficial, but they should go simultaneously. Therefore, their development was simultaneously, but more uh, attention was paid to uh, sciences right from the beginning and all that. But it was, uh, after the Second World War, that the things changed tremendously. Here also, because of nuclear explosion in Japan, two atom bombs, the benefits of uh, science became quite obvious. And as a result, uh, it was under the leadership of the United States. In fact, social sciences should be grateful to the post-1945 uh, period when there was a Cold War started between, between the Eastern Bloc, what we call it, uh, Warsaw Pact countries. And we know today Russia has again has invaded Ukraine, which was earlier the part of Soviet Union, and also Russia before Bolshevik Revolution, and the NATO countries, 
under the leadership of America. It is in this particular context, that is, we call it Cold War, that America poured large amounts of money in scientific research. But at the same time, some portion of money it also used in for, for social research. And it started a project which was called area studies. And under these area studies, uh, the in American universities, the money came and most of the professors became experts in uh, what we call it uh, different areas and different countries were chosen and they went there. We also have a share of a large number of such social scientists, scholars, critical scientists, sociologists, and others who came to India for study, particularly during the Green Revolution, they came. But then the significance of this particular uh, 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 social science research became more important when there was a threat of communist insurgencies in Latin American countries. Because at that time, we, it was realized that anthropologists, botanists, biologists, and social science sociologists, they are all relevant. So wherever there used to be a problem, there would be an anthropologist going, sociologist going, botanist going, and zoologist going. So in 1990, uh, when the Cold War ended, the significance of social sciences started declining. And by the end of 20th century, uh, some of the scientists started questioning the value of social sciences. And there was a response from uh, what we call it social scientists, but I'll not talk about it. But I am just telling that how now we find that uh, more and more a shrinking of the space of social sciences is taking place all over the world. And, uh, but still, in some of the places, social sciences are comprehensively studied, no doubt about it. But the major question which is raised with regard to social sciences is that what is their benefit? What is their usefulness for society and all that? Now it is in this context uh, that when social sciences and sciences are uh, not having a, some kind of equilibrium simply because of the historical reasons, we have to go back and look at what is the nature of science and how do we understand social science and what social what function social science performs in relation to uh, the people, nations, state, and international. So what I do is that I start with what we call it revolutions in science, just to understand the nature of science. I will be very, very precise. But at the same time, I'll just identify certain things and talk about that how these things are important. Now, revolutions in science began with Copernicus, who died in 1543. And just before his death, he published his work. Uh, he said its title is uh, Latin or Italian, uh, that I don't know. But uh, it was this particular work which, which started the, what we call it, science revolution or revolution in science. Now, what, and let us be very clear about Copernicus. He was not simply an astronomer. He was also a mathematician and also an economist, all things combined. That was what is the nature of uh, the scholarship around, on, on, during this particular period. Now, what he provided was heliocentric view of of uh, the world, particularly the universe, in which he argued that sun is the center of the universe. That was, till that time, Earth was regarded. We, we had a notion of universe which was Earth-centric, Earth and it was the Roman Catholic Church, particularly the church which was very clear on this particular point, that Earth is the center of the universe because God has created man as the special being. And but whatever is the we call it the Christian mythology, which is also uh, what we call it uh, uh, Old Testament and other things which we have. So he did not want to be punished and he published his book in 1543. Now 16th century, when this starts, it is a very important period in, the, in Europe. Because in, uh, during this particular time, Europe is the center stage of 
major upsurge which, which took place in religion. And it started with Germany, where a priest, Luther, he posted uh, certain questions on the cathedral in one of the cities, which were regarding what we call it, Reformation. And in Reformation, the various rulers of various principalities of Germany, they supported Luther because they were very unhappy with the Pope. Because 1517, being the Julie uh, indulgence were collected and the taxes used to go through what we call it, the swans or tithes to uh, <coughs> Rome. So the, the princes combined and there was a religious protest. And ultimately what happened, some countries left the Roman Catholic fold and became protestants. So there was a crisis in these countries which became protestant. Because when Roman Catholic religion was the only religion, at that time, the God was represented, of, uh, the, sorry, the king was the representative of God. Therefore, he had the divine authority to rule over his subjects and citizens. But with the Reformation, the kings lost that legitimacy which came from divine, uh, what we call it, intervention. Therefore, in order to counter this kind of threat, they started giving more liberties to the people in those countries where Protestantism started or was established. England was one, Holland was another, then various German uh, principalities or uh, states, they, they're all we had, what we call it, Protestantism. So Copernicus could be seen in the background of Reformation in terms of how the European religious scene underwent a change. And Copernicus book was not among the recommended books of the Roman Catholic Church. It is one of the prohibited. If I am not wrong, I don't have no try to find out this information, but maybe still it is among the banned books with the Roman Catholic Church. So astronomy was a subject which was a very general subject because it, behaved, it dealt with the, uh, what we call it, the word, terrestrial word with the heavenly bodies and their movements and their appearances and other things. Uh, and uh, but then what we have is the subsequent to, up to particularly when Galileo comes to the scene. And it is here that the benefits of uh, sciences being realized when Galileo was the first to develop what we call it parabola, in which he could develop the angle at which the artillery should fire so that it goes to the accurate place and identify the target. We now know that at 45 degree, Perhaps the uh, you, it goes the longest, and uh, so Kepler and Galileo both they started you know working on planetary motions. Galileo was demanded; he was also punished. He was asked to apologize, but then you know uh, what we call it uh, uh, came. What we call it 17th century, and in 17th century it was England where revolution started taking place in the form of Newton. Sometimes later, the famous classical poet of uh, England, Alexander Poe, wrote a poem. Uh, I will just quote two, two lines. He says that nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Now, we all know that Newton is known for his, uh, what we call it, uh, is uh, uh, theory of motion uh, and then gravity. And the gravity is very important because uh, some work had already been done by Galileo, particularly his famous uh, experiment with Pisa at Pisa Tower. But it was Newton who was able to establish that how this entire universe is maintained at a place. Uh, because one thing was that it was a question of inertia. Why these heavenly bodies, why these bodies, they remain at a place where they are and keep on being there. And when they are moving, they are moving in the same predictable repetitive time process. And then what is holding them together? 
these were the answers which Newton gave. And with that, uh, you know, the all earlier knowledge disappeared. It was the 17th century science which transformed the entire world as Burton Russell says into the modern world. It is century is a very interesting. As you understand the behavior and the nature of physical world, you would like to know about the composition of the physical world. And chemistry comes there. And the person at that time people didn't know about oxygen, but they always thought, particularly those who were working in this area, other than all chemists, they always argued that there is a, an element called phlogiston, and I'm sure that. Any student of science at graduation and post-graduation level might not have heard about the word phlogiston, which was very, very popular till uh, Lavoisier comes on the scene. Now, this particular phlogiston was understood as highly combustible element. And the moment you put it fire on fire, it burns immediately. And it was because of this that presence of phlogiston that some of the things are highly combustible whereas others were not and uh, it was Lavoisier who said no there is some gas in the atmosphere which helps in the burning and the other things are in the nature of the thing which burns and obviously simultaneously Priestley also worked on it and in the process what happened that we have oxygen and then he worked out he did not only work on the very principle of uh, oxygen making some kind of uh, uh, compounds with the things, but also argued that the matter is indestructible. It is, uh, it, it, is, it, is not, it cannot be destructed if you put it on fire and then if it burns because the ash is only one residue. Think of the gas which is emitted and you combine all then you will see that the weight is more. Therefore, some other element from the atmosphere have joined it to make it some other compounds. This transformed the very understanding of uh, what we call it, the composition of the world into elements, compounds, and other things that we take big thing. Earlier, most of the innovations in chemistry took place because people believed that you can make gold by mixing some, some chemicals and all that. But once you are understanding the major attention reverted to uh, what we call it to the life, how life has come about it. Now, religion had always provided adequate answers to this. But when it started in the 19th century about what actually is life, then various things were happened. And it is here that social sciences and biology began to coincide with each other. We all know that it was because of Malthus's book, Essays on Population, that it triggered the minds of two people, Wallace and Darwin, who started talking about natural selection, survival of the fittest and other things, and talk, talked about evolution. But it was Herbert Spencer who decisively influenced Darwin's thought, though Darwin uh, did not want to use the word survival of the fittest. He had a much better idea about that. But then, then uh, what happened that uh, then the evolution of the species idea came. But uh, Charles Darwin could not give full answer to all evolutions because the example, there were so many examples given. And then there was a Scandinavian priest, Mandel, who had published his book, uh, article in a journal. And uh, very few years after, uh, Darwin had published his Origin of Species. And in this particular book, uh, article, he talked about, about heredity and environment. And it took another 36 years, 35 years, then how that this thing is you know, working and then how new species could emerge. Now I have said all this thing to make sense of science, because uh, otherwise I would have elaborated much more on it, but my basic point is that we should understand science. 
science right from its growth because technology is something which does not come and clash with anybody any value any society any belief any religion but science does but science tends to explain things which are already been answered in some of the religious texts all over the world whether it is christianity because christianity islam and judaism have common theology or other religions like hinduism or any other religion there certain answers have been given to these questions but when science uh, answers those questions it answers it in a different way so therefore when we talk about that how science developed from 17th century or 16th 17th 18th 19th centuries we also have to ask that what is it which makes it possible for science to continuously grow and develop now it is here that uh, one of the philosophers of science whose known is the name is karl popper he argues that science is essentially based on the principle of falsification that we create explanations and hypotheses which can be proved or disproved science does not give the final answer it gives a uh, it is here that the again another problem comes in with uh, with science i'll talk about it when i come to social sciences because uh, you have a hypothesis in science for example you have a famous dalton hypothesis any any professor of chemistry or student of chemistry who is aware of what is dalton's hypothesis but uh, if i am not sure i think there is also a journal by the name of dalton's hypothesis which says that under the similar conditions of temperature and pressure equal volumes of all gases contain equal number of atoms uh, before i explain this let me tell you i am not a science student i have read only after becoming professor of science a professor not lecturer <clears throat> and uh, no uh, this particular hypothesis if you test it it can be disproved it will never establish as a law simply because atom of all gases all gases are not elements there are gases which are compounds for example hydrochloric acid gas or uh, nitrogen peroxide or hydrogen sulfide now if we say that uh, there is one atom one atom of hydrogen chloride will have half atom of hydrogen and half atom of chlorine which is not possible because atom is the smallest indivisible part of the matter so therefore the it was discussed it was articulated and finally uh, we came up with uh, what is called uh, avogadro's law which says that equal volumes of ga- all gases contain equal number of molecules not atoms so that became the law because it was accepted this is not the first time it happened even in 20th century when schrodinger's wave equation came for which he got nobel prize schrodinger uh, because his basic argument was that electron has wave character but when the calculations were made it became clear that you cannot explain the behavior of electron science had developed that much as a result of which it was finally uh, decided or discussed and then that the electron has a dual character both, both material and the what we call it the wave character but the thing is that since there is an uncertainty principle involved in it or certain principle but that so see which we also see that if a body is moving you cannot tell its speed and its position at the same time so under some such conditions and arguments schrodinger's wave equation was this thing so if we look at from the beginning to this thing either science started you know struggling with the established ideas and giving hypotheses which could be disproved and falsified but this process come but this also is the secret of what we call it the success of science and the development of science because development science is continuously growing and let's be very clear science cannot predict it is only in the case of astronomy that it was possible to predict for example halley's comet halley's comet halley could predict that the comet would uh, appear in the in this particular year because he understood the periodicity of the process 
that after every 39 or 50 years, this comet is uh, appearing. Therefore, it would appear on this day because it appeared in on this particular year. This particular year. But the moment you start going into the complex explanations and falsifiable hypothesis, you will find that it it can it its prediction level begins to uh, decline. And um, we have so many of these things. So that's why we have been successfully predicting uh, the eclipses. Astronomy uh, is master in predicting. But the moment we go ahead of it uh, with the chemistry and physics and other sciences, prediction declines. Because <clears throat> we don't give a final answer. We always give falsifiable answers and so long as it is not falsified, then that remains established and then research is done, ultimately it is rejected. <clears throat> now I come to social sciences. The social sciences, uh, the concept begins with this particular aspect. Now, one of the major issues in social sciences is that social sciences do not create theories which are based on falsifiable uh, hypotheses. Uh, in the sense that uh, with, whichever is there, it is is to remember it. If <clears throat> 17th and 18th century notion of logistic is now absent uh, among, uh, among, the, among the students of science, it is because it has no use because it has been rejected. But in social sciences, it is not, it does not happen that a particular theory is rejected. They all remain. It is only that some theories become very popular because of certain reasons, and then others don't disappear. Anytime they can become popular uh, and again become current, uh, this thing. Why this happens, this is something which is very important. It is here that the first difference, first issue, is distinction between the two comes in. <clears throat> in 1956 or 1957, there was a philosopher called Galley. Galley <clears throat> read a paper, and the title of the paper is Essentially Contested Concepts. And uh, he argued that Social sciences and humanities have concepts which are essentially contested. Like, you know, 20th century philosopher Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, he starts with and he writes his first work, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. <clears throat> he says that all the propositions of sciences are true propositions, and all the propositions of social sciences are typologies. And why their methodology is because every concept is contested. This is one thing. Second, I'll come to why between science says this. That uh, <coughs> I remember when I was a student of sociology in college, and our one subject was what is sociology, and other was what is society. When this question would come in the final examination, and we after taking the examination, when we will come out we will exchange notes with each other and one will say, I have given five definitions of sociology. Somebody will say, I have given six definitions of sociology. Now the question is, this is only one subject called sociology, but why there are six definitions of sociology? Why there are seven definitions of sociology? Why there are so many definitions of society? Now the reason is that we do not agree with the concept, but we do not have the ability to reject one concept, because any concept which is given is rationally argued that this is how we can define, and with time, this happens. So the result is that uh, all concepts and theories in social sciences are contested. Whereas, because of the principle of falsification in sciences, the concepts and theories which either are agreed upon or they are forgotten. forgotten. So, I, if I am not wrong, that the definition of viscosity or um, uh, velocity or uh, surface tension and uh, distance traveled in nanoseconds, anything which is there, uh, or entropy, 
all remain the same. And everybody remembers it because everybody knows that this is how it is defined. There are so many concepts. But in social sciences, this doesn't happen. One would say, no, I, this is how I think society is. And the other would say, no, this is how I think society is. This is one thing because of which social sciences and sciences, they depart from each other. Both claim that we are sciences. And uh, even in sciences, we have so much of, you know, uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> subjects and other things. And in social sciences, we also have so many disciplines which are there. Now, the second thing is very tricky. And since it is a tricky, let me give an example from science first. <clears throat> this is not my original. I have not thought about it. Uh, it has been given to me, a great friend of mine who is no more now. Now, honeybees, let us take the example of honeybees. Now, honeybees, as we know that in the class and sector, uh, in the phylum arthropoda and class and sector, particularly in class and sector, some of the species, uh, or let us say, uh, and when they, they, when they reproduce, there is a division of labor according to their uh, biological characteristics. There are workers, and then there are fighters, soldiers, and there is mother queen, and then there are scouts and all those things. So in the case of honeybees, <clears throat> their major source is nectar from flowers. So what happens is that first of all, it is the scouts who go out and find out where nectar is available. We don't know the nature of communication among the honeybees, but they go out and when they come back, they communicate it to the workers. And then the workers go out and collect the nectar. But in this process of communication and going, coming back and then going, it has never happened that wherever the scouts identified, the nectar is not there. Nectar would always be there. So in, in certain ways, the, in the behavior of other animals is something which is highly predictable and definite in a, in a particular sense of the term. But in the case of humans, we cannot say it. So for example, I, I just look at the present uh, scenario. You know that so many elections are going on and all the TV channels are you know, heated up to cover these elections. Uh, by way of an exercise, please uh, take uh, 10 minutes for each, uh, what do we call it, channel and see that they are giving the information, they are reporting from the same location, but the, their content and their wording and the language, they are so different from each other. And that also explains that uh, there is something which, is, which distinguishes uh, humans from the others. One is that telling a lie is something which is, the, which is the unique characteristic of only one species, which is called human beings. This is one. If, if I don't uh, go out of uh, the, the, the discipline of social sciences or giving wrong information. So only we have this particular quality. Now why we have this particular kind of equality? We have this particular quality because we are subjective people. We have consciousness. We are uh, just not the object of other action, others' actions. We are also conscious beings who have the ability. We have so many abilities. We have the ability to analyze, understand, and we also have the flexibility. We can look back and try to make sense of what has happened earlier and remember it. We do not remember only those things which are dangerous and good things for us, as in the generally, but we also remember things which are sad, which are talked about, which people behave in a particular manner. So our memory of reflexivity is not simply <clears throat> confined to the principle of our survival, which is there in the case of animals, but it is also in the case of, in terms of the sociability. It is also in the terms of sociability. So therefore, what happens that in the case of human beings, this is subject to consciousness. This particular subjectivity, this involves so many things about human beings. One is that 
all humans have objectives, intentions, motivation, and certain circumstances in which they live, and they act and react. Plus, single example uh, to this, uh, I think uh, I, sh I should give. Uh, you know, Juan Pavlov's name is known to most of the biology people and psychologists. I remember I this student of psychology at graduate level and in learning. Uh, theory of learning group have conducted an experiment on a dog and it is um, ringing the bell and then giving the food to the, to the dog and after some time when he would ring the bell and then you know the, the dog would start salivating because he would expect food in other words the dog had learned to respond to the stimulus of bell uh, so this is something which, which, which was the most popular theory of learning in the context of biology and in psychology, particularly in the case of animal psychology. Obviously, later on, more such has come, and as a result, we find that there are some animals who are much better, more better cognition. But that apart, so, so what happens that you cannot, I have learned it from there, that you cannot uh, human beings cannot be conditioned on, on with the stimulus. So if you give a stimulus to 10 people of a particular kind, the response would vary. And it is something which is, you know, which one has to learn in the sense that. I remember a book by Adelaide Huxley. Adelaide Huxley wrote a novel called Brave New World. And Brave New World is a theme which then recurrently appearing in, in, with the different ideas, different things. And many people have uh, done, uh, written George Orwell's 1984. But uh, largely, Brave New World was a very different kind of uh, uh, novel. One thing which has struck me is that uh, uh, the, the people who were controlling the society, they thought that people could be uh, forced to, people could be forced to learn what they want. So they thought that right from the childhood, we can uh, bombard certain things in their mind, and then perhaps they will learn. But later on, they discovered the only thing people can learn with this bombardment is morality, perhaps, or ethics a little bit, otherwise no. People learn from their experience, they develop consciousness. Now, this kind of thing is something which happens. It does not mean that the people have not tried uh, uh, in, to do it, particularly in the present century. People have tried doing it, and they have been partially successful, though it has been again tried. But again, you know, there are certain mechanisms in which it has been done. I give an example. Uh, the example is that uh, there was a young boy who came from Poland. His name was Kosinski. Uh, Kosinski came to a Cambridge University. And uh, in Cambridge University, he joined as a researcher in psychology. Uh, and uh, as a researcher of psychology, he started working on a very strange kind of topic. And the topic was that, is it possible to control the attitude and consciousness of people, human beings, and also collectively? So for that particular purpose, he identified uh, five, uh, what we call it, variables. Uh, this is a very popular term in both sciences and social sciences. Let me read these five variables. One is called openness. The other is conscientiousness. Third is extroversion. Fourth is agreeableness. And fifth is neuroticism. 
So, uh, which means that how people are open to the new ideas, what level of morality they have, how uh, they mix up with others, how they uh, try to agree to any idea which gave or do not an eroticism, what kind of suspicions, doubts, and abnormalities they have, which are against conformities. And then the problem was that uh, where to get data about people, from people. And suddenly he realized, I'm talking about a very contemporary example. Suddenly he realized that all this data are available, this data is available from the Facebook. And uh, one of the things which he identified is uh, we put likes if somebody says something. And if you work out then person on how many posts he or she has agreed, then it means that agreeableness is very high. And uh, so in that process, he found that uh, all the data are available at the, his book. And then he got terrified. And he terrified, got so terrified that he abandoned it. But then there was a fellow who had already established a company called uh, Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica. And uh, Cambridge Analytica man came to him, his name was I think Alexander Knox or something like that. And he uh, requested Kosinski to join him in the project that uh, we would do on elections and other things. But he refused because he thought that it was the, he, he was anticipating a normality of deception, which this model would create. And so he refused. And, uh, but uh, then there was a, uh, what we call a referendum in England on joining or leaving the uh, European Union. And it is said that the conservative elements who favored uh, leaving the European Union, they employed Cambridge Analytica, and that is before us. Many people say that even Donald Trump employed uh, this company, and uh, the one example which they give is uh, from uh, Florida. Uh, if you remember Hillary Clinton, who was contesting for the post of president of the and uh, when Donald Trump went to Florida, he spoke on that how uh, Bill Clinton did not help Happy when there was an earthquake. Now, people felt very strange that how come Donald Trump is talking about Hathians in Florida? But then, it was discovered that there was a large population of Hathians in, in Florida. And after the, this particular election, those Hathians did not, they would have definitely voted for Hillary Clinton. They did not go to vote. So what happened that uh, when, this, when Donald Trump won, many people who were aware that what has happened, they started writing to Kosinski. By that time, Kosinski had done his PhD and joined as an assistant professor in some university in the United States. And he time and again told people that, look here, I have not participated in this exercise, right? And no, <clears throat> we are now looking at <clears throat> certain social parameters in which social sciences can be used to control the mind of the people. You know, there was one point of time in which, uh, you know, uh, social democrats of Europe used to make a kind of a three point uh, note. One was that you have a mass movement, you have intense propaganda, and then you create an enemy, create a fear among the people that look here, bourgeoisie is exploiting you. Those times are gone. And uh, still there are two, three minutes. I will conclude. I think you are about to say to me that I should finish. Uh, uh, I think I have two, three minutes. So uh, 
what happens is that sir uh, sorry 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 in prepping for this sir we have only 4 minutes and we have to know all uh, formalities we have to do but and, let me conclude okay yes, do the formality after 10 minutes i am i am here for lecture but let me speak uh, you gave me 1 hour and uh, you are asking me to close in 45 minutes because let me complete so what happens is that uh, <clears throat> Then uh, let me shorten my last comment because I thought I'll. Then what happened that there was a uh, blame on social sciences that uh, they cannot predict. There is science can predict. I have already answered that. And suddenly we have social scientists coming out, out with a methodology called Clio Dynamics, in which they say that if you have a long duty data, statistical data, you can predict the future. But let me tell you, nobody can predict the future. Even science cannot predict the future. Only astronomy can predict the future and certain other things. But not society, not social sciences. Some human element, some subjective element would always come. But the relevance of social sciences are always realized when the consequences of the development of science and technology create serious societal conflict. This has been historically seen. I think I should stop here again, congratulating the university and uh, kind of a thing. And uh, thank you very much for inviting. Uh, thank you very much for, sir, uh, for your enlightening and uh, thought-provoking ideas in the perspective of uh, uh, dichotomy of sciences and social sciences. So having, keeping in mind, uh, time is very less. Now I request uh, Professor uh, Felix, please uh, 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 play the national anthem uh, before, uh, before uh, now let me propose word of thanks. First of all, I extend warm thanks from a core of heart to the speaker, uh, Parmaji Singh Judge. Also to the Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, to DIA, DSW, Dean School, schools, HODs, faculty members, participants, the scholars, and students. And also ex express my thanks to the whole organizing team, headed by Professor P.K. Mishra and uh, to other uh, uh, members, Dr. Bali Bahadur, Dr. Harat Meena, Dr. Jantwa Swain, Dr. Ripal Singh Ji, and Dr. Sandeep Kaur. Now I would request a, a Professor. Uh, Bast, please uh, uh, play the national anthem. Please stand up. Please raise everybody. Yes. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Utkala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhita Ranga Tavashubha Name Jage Tavashubha Ashish Mage Gahe Tavajaya Gatha Janagana Mangala Dayaka Jayahe 